Hello, everybody. I'm Nick, and I'm the media coordinator here at Notre Dame. Before we get started with uh, tonight's uh, heresy talk, a couple, two quick announcements. Uh, tomorrow, we're having a young adult mass at the Grotto for ages uh, 18 to 35. It'll be followed by a brief socially distant uh, uh, social with some light refreshments. Uh, so if you are a young adult that's watching this, feel free to come by. Or if you know a young Catholic adult who might be interested in this, uh, feel free to pass the word along. It should be, should be a nice night. Um, at the end of the month, I believe next week, uh, Josephine and John are music uh, people. Josephine's our music director. John is our organist. They'll be putting on uh, some jazz nights on the front lawn of the school. Um, so, you, you know, feel free to bring chairs if you want to bring some food for your family. Uh, it'll just be a nice chill night with uh, jazz, pop, and everything in between is what they told me. So it should be very interesting music. Um, at the end of the month, on July 30th, we will be having Stump the Seminarians again, but this time we'll be doing it in person. So Harrison, Dennis, and myself will be in the church, 730. Uh, you can ask questions the night of, like usual when it's in person, or if you want to keep submitting in advance anonymously, feel free to do that. Uh, we will live stream it for those that uh, can't attend in person with the health restrictions, but uh, just please know that it, for this one, we won't be checking the Facebook comments uh, as much for questions. So if you put... If you do want to submit a question and, you're, and you don't plan on attending in person, be sure to do it anonymously at that form, notredamenhp.com slash questions. All right, here they are, our seminarians. Father Scalero, how are you guys doing? Good, good. how are you, Nick? Doing all right. Good, good. What heresies are you talking about tonight? Arianism and Nestorianism. Okay, yeah. both words. I don't know what any of the, I don't know either of those. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know either of them. So, okay, cool. Well, uh, I'm going to hand it off to you guys like last time, so... Tell us uh, how right. started. Thank you, Nikolai. No problem. Yeah, so maybe uh, to contextualize, remind everybody, last week we talked about uh, two heresies, Gnosticism and Pelagianism. And maybe one of the sort of conclusions we came to when we talk about heresy, um, they are big words that are scary. We think, oh, whatever, they were a long time ago. But the hope is we realize these are ideas in the early church especially, trying to figure out what exactly we believe, how we refine our teachings about the Trinity, about Christ, um, about God himself. Um, it was sort of this active conversation, sorting out what do we believe. And a lot of these heresies were taking these difficult teachings and trying to make sense of them, trying to almost eliminate the mystery from them by making them, you know, comprehensible to our minds. So we talked about something like Gnosticism, where that, there's that disconnect between how physical is bad, spiritual is good. And, of course, we see the two responses that led to on one side, you have people who just did whatever, you know, a hedonistic lifestyle, you know, what does it matter? The body is useless. There's the others who became very penitential, you know, we need to fast and deny ourselves of these bad physical things for the supernatural. We have the Gnostics who also, you know, had these ideas about the special knowledge you needed to be saved, something we saw, maybe we think of our own time, how people think they have their own answers to these big questions, how they have the secret to salvation apart from the church. And the other side, we talked about Pelagianism, this trying to figure out how are we saved. So we have Pelagians, you know, sort of this idea that we take it upon ourselves. We can save ourselves. We're not broken. It's, it's hard to imagine, you know, us who are broken creatures being redeemed and raised to new life, you know, without needing our consent. Or So there's this excess of this desire to say, okay, no, no, we do it all on our own. Um, so there's sort of an interesting conversation we had last time, and this week, as you said, Dennis is going to talk a little about Arianism, and Harrison is going to talk about Nestorianism. Um, so maybe we'll start with Dennis. Uh, why don't you tell us a little, give us a little intro about, you know, what is Arianism, who is Arius, give us a little context. Sure. Arianism is a heresy that, at its most base form, denies the divinity of Christ. It says that Christ is not God, and therefore denies the Trinity. Um, Arius was a, I believe, a bishop, yes, Father, in the early church who taught this. He said that Christ was not divine, that um, God created Christ. And since Christ was created, he was therefore limited and therefore not God. You know, God came first and then Christ, not what church believes, which is that, you know, the Son is begotten through God but not created. He has always been, he will always be, like God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. This actually became a rather popular teaching. And when I say rather popular, I mean that I think at one point, two-thirds of all the world's bishops were Aryan. So we have problems now, but we came over problems then too. Yeah. 
just a little a little thing. Two thirds of bishops in the world were heretics, um, and a big opponent of Arius was Saint Nicholas, Santa Claus. <laughs> I'm not making that. I'm not making that up. Saint Nicholas was a big detractor, as was Saint Athanasius. But um, Arianism was the main subject of the Council of Constantinople, which was one of the first big church councils called by Emperor Constantine, who had legalized Christianity. So this is a very, very big deal. And one of my favorite church stories of all time is that Arius and St. Nicholas were having a very, let's say, passionate debate about whether Christ was God or whether he was not God. St. Nicholas saying he was God, Arius saying he wasn't. Eventually, things got heated, and St. Nicholas um, punched Arius in the face. <laughs> Again, not making that up. <laughs> he went to jail. So, fun part of church history. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of Arianism, that Christ not the divine trinity is not God, was condemned at Council of Constantinople, and therefore is, you know, heretical. It's, it's untrue, obviously, because Christ is God. So, so tell me, why, why did they think that, what was the trouble with saying that Christ was God? What, is the, what did they sort of come to the conclusion of? One of the big issues they had was, well, if Christ was God, how could he die on the cross? How can God be killed? Which, on the surface, fair question. But when you, leave, when you go deeper into it, the fact that God did die for us is kind of what makes our faith. He wasn't, he wasn't just, anyone can die. You know, that's it's not that hard. Um, but the fact that God himself, who knew he was going to die on the cross, for he knew all, still chose to do so, that is what makes the crucifixion such an important part of our faith. That's why in every church, there's a crucifix up there in the office, that's why we have that crucifix, because God willingly chose to die. God chose to die for us, for us sinners. That is why the crucifixion is so important. If God didn't die, then so what? You know, why is he any different than the other person who died for what he believed? Because he's just a person. He's just a man, a human. But Christ was fully human and fully God. And therefore his death and his defeating of death by rising again is what makes it so important. I think. I think it's a big part of that is this idea that none of us could ever pay that back. You know, every yes. sin we commit against God is infinite. It's only the death of a, a perfectly innocent, you know, offering that could atone for it, an infinite crime. Paul um, what about tends to be able to make things sound much better than I can, so happy he's done. <laughs> no, no, no. So that was a, so it's interesting. So a big part of it was, one, it's hard to grasp this idea of Christ as God because what he went through, what he did. What about the idea of the Trinity? Uh, do you think there was a, I mean, I think most people would have this trouble with this idea, aren't you? Aren't they three gods? Mm. Was it? That well, I, I'm not sure if that was explicitly an Aryan idea, but it does come forth from Aryan ideals. So, it would, you know, God the Father, you know, when you refer to someone as Father, you, you think of a creator, you know, as your father, you know, and your mother created you, well, God the Father will have created God the Son. The Son, you know, that obviously also implies creation, and the Holy Spirit, it doesn't. But um, if, I remember, this is back years ago in seminary, I remember I heard a great quote, which is, to be created is to be limited. So it's like a paradox. You know, could God create a stone that he can't lift? No, because that would apply a limitless rock. And if it's created, it cannot be limitless. So Christ was not created. There was never a time where Christ was not. Yeah. There was never a time that the Holy Spirit was not. So, so something, Harrison? Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about Arius because he said that you know Christ wasn't God. But he said he was kind of like this intermediate stage, right? Like this semi-divine oh, yeah. semi being, right? Yes. 
so there, there, um, he was almost going for like, you could say that it was like a compromise okay. kind of thing between you like know, two um, extremes. Yes. Between two extremes that, you know, Christ was God, Christ, not at all God. So Ares is kind of trying to say that, well, he, he was kind of like a demigod, like Hercules or, uh, Achilles of the great Greek and Roman odysseys. But there's a great quote by Cardinal Newman, um, who said that, you know, for those who don't know, Cardinal Newman was, when I was Catholic, he was an Anglican, but he converted to Catholicism. And one of the things he converted was he realized that, you know, Christ is not the compromise. Christ is the extreme of the paradox. He is fully God. So trying to reduce Christ from being God to being, you know, well, he's not just a man, but he's not really God. He's like, a, he's sort of like halfway there. What are you doing? You're saying that God is not God, which is, you know, heretical. Um, and what might be interesting, I know um, a lot of people struggle with the new translation, that idea of consubstantial. So there was huge fights over the use. So the Greek, you know, this is kind of boring probably, but there's this idea yeah, of homoousios means one in substance, consubstantial. And there's homoousios. You, in, you insert an iota, the littlest letter, and you, it becomes kind of like the same substance. Yeah. So there's these, these people trying to find a compromise to say, oh, well, you know, it's kind of like the substance of God, but not really, you know, like, like Dennis was saying, it's okay. There's completely not God, completely God. Let's just go in the middle. But Newman said, no, 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 it's, he's got to be all in. And that yeah. was part of, like you said, that was part of his big conversion as he wrote um, yeah. Development of Doctrine. You, you, can't be, you can't be kind of God. Right. That's not how that works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and now, so maybe another thing that might be interesting to think about. So Christ is born, you know, he's begotten of the Father. Yes. But he's with God for all eternity. Yes. Which I'm sure a lot of people struggle with the idea. How could something be, you know, how can a father not be before a son? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it's just the fact that, you know, the Godhead, the three persons and the one God, it is one God. And I think something that might help is, you know, yes, take away. The, the, the term father and son you know, it's not a strict sense like we understand it, but biologically, but because we understand the relationship between a father and son biologically, we can use those terms with, you know, God the Father and God the Son to kind of understand them in a sense, I think, in the sense that although, you know, God the Father didn't, you know, in time temporally precede the Son, he is the source of all being from which the Son is generated. I think that's the proper term, right, Father? Yeah. And so I don't I don't want to start getting into, you know, which person generates who and who proceeds from who because I'm not too familiar with that and I feel like I'm definitely going to say something wrong. So if you want if you want <laughs> I got comment, my heresy button. Yeah, <laughs> you might need to use it, but if you want to comment on that fine, but I think the idea is like the father is the source of all being from which the son is. Now that's not to say the son was created, but it's just saying that the again, the term is generation. The father generates the son. So even though both of them have always been, they always coexist in there of the same substance. The son takes his being from the father. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, I think you put it well, and I always found it interesting. It's a logical order as opposed to a chronological. Yeah. And this yeah. is, you know, we, we think of God, we don't try to comprehend him in our own context, and yet God is outside of time. So for all eternity, He's giving all of himself to his son, and for all of eternity, the son is returning that in love, and the, all eternity, the love between them is the spirit, and it enters time. And part of the struggle, I guess, is to try to understand an infinite, eternal God in time and space. Yeah. Mm. And so that's yeah. kind of what we're seeing in Arianism, is trying to make sense of, you know, these very difficult ideas. Like you've been talking about, you know, humanity and divinity coming together in one person and being here. You know, three persons, one God. So it's almost... I like to think if we lived back then, we'd all be tempted by this. It's a lot easier to be an yeah. Aryan. Like, there's none of these paradoxes. There's none of these mysteries. Um, so it's, it's like you can see the temptation, like you said, Dennis. You know, two-thirds of bishops 
you know, bought it. They said, oh, this is great. Makes it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Let's look at that. Um, when, when you bring up time, Father, um, that reminds me of something. I was going to, um, there, there is this, um, amongst some, you know, some people, there's this thought that, you know, when it comes to some church teaching, um, that, well, you know, Christ was, you know, he was in his own time. And he, obviously in that time they thought that, but now we know better. You know, we're, we're more enlightened and we are aware that something should, should change because, you know, like, um, women's ordination, for example. Um, well, you know, everyone back then, you know, that every, you know, women were lesser people, but now, now that, you know, we know better, clearly that church, that teaches to change because he, he just, he was of his time. That's, um, that is a type of variant because you're basically saying that Christ wasn't omnipotent, that he wouldn't have seen what will be, that he doesn't know what is going to happen, that he's not God. That he would just, oh, well, he, he, he couldn't know, you know, cause he was, you know, 30 AD. What do they know in 30 AD? Which on the surf, again, on the surface is a question that can be asked. But when you start to think about it, you're basically saying Christ only knew what was in front of him. He didn't know that he, he didn't know that he was God. And it's very clear in the scriptures that he knew that he was God. Um, yeah. Same thing with sin. Like, well, Christ wouldn't have said that, you know, certain things are sins now because, well, we, we know better. We, we, we've gone past that point. You know, it's, it's 2020. How's it a sin anymore? Which, eh. but that is again saying that Christ didn't know everything. And it is church teaching that Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane during before his passion was to begin, he saw every sin to be committed by all of mankind, every single one. And he still chose to die for mankind. Think about that. Every single sin you ever committed in your life, he knew that was going to happen. He knew you would do it. And he still died for you. He still wanted to redeem you because he loves you deeply more than you could ever know. Yeah, and that's, that is an interesting way to look at it, and it's sort of beautiful reflection, and, and part of it is this reduction of Christ. And that's a big part of this, is that any, if you're trying to rationalize his divinity, his humanity, you're very often just going to destroy the essence of who he is. You lose salvation, you lo lose his identity, you lose the ability to explain so much of who he was just to make it easier to grasp. And again, and then it almost becomes too yeah. small because we're shrinking it down to the size of our minds. Yeah, um, Christ, Christ certainly was a man in his times in the sense that he could use expressions and phrases and locations that people of that particular time would be aware of. Like, how many yeah. times do you hear in a homily, like, when Christ said this, it's like a Jewish type of idiom or whatever that means this, that's kind of lost in history. But that, yeah. that he's not constricted by his time. He goes beyond yeah. it. He uses the tools of his time to help, you know, get to the hearts of the people at that time. But, you know, like we said, in the Gospel of John, how many times does it, you know, refer to his divinity saying that, okay, he was in this time, but he's not of that time. Yes. Great. Good. Um, any more thoughts on uh, Arianism? Uh, I, I found it interesting. Here's something that I didn't know that, you know, I always knew that, you know, like we have some disagreements with other, you know, Christian sects, but I didn't realize that there are Christian sects, you know, sects that call themselves Christians today that are explicitly Aryan, like um, yes. Jehovah Witnesses, if I'm yes. not mistaken. They they actually would be, they are. They, they wouldn't call yeah. themselves an Aryan by name, but they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They believe that he's yeah. a lesser being. And if I'm not mistaken, the Mormons as well, they don't believe I that believe Jesus Christ correct. is God. Yeah. They just believe that he's, you know, like this kind of semi-divine being, which I thought that was interesting to learn. Yes. It's, uh, there's an expression that there are no new heresies. So things that, you know, beliefs that were condemned never really went away. They just kind of come back with new names. Yeah, and that's, I think, sort of like you mentioned, that modern issues of taking Christ and, you know, those are just a similar idea, just reheated. Yeah. Yeah. 
Awesome. Some historianism? Historianism. Sure. Um, Give us. Go for it. Give us the down low. Go for it. Yeah, so I'll start with the person. So like Arianism, it was named after the person that kind of espoused these ideas. His name was Nestorius. He was from Antioch originally, but like by 428 AD, he was actually um, Bishop of Constantinople. And so there is kind of this debate on whether he personally believed a heresy or not. And we can go back and forth about that, you know, for a long time. But what is clear is that in his words and in his writings, he he espoused beliefs that would be recognized as heresy after the fact. And he was actually condemned at the Council of uh, Ephesus in 431 AD as a heretic. And so what did he say? Um, so before he was um, espousing, <coughs> excuse me. Before he was espousing heresy, he was actually a pretty orthodox dude. He was he was vehemently against the Arians. Um, and then the first couple of days of him becoming bishop, he actually burnt down an Arian chapel because that's how much he didn't like these guys. But that same year, on Christmas Day nonetheless, for his homily, he said that the Virgin Mary is not the Theotokos. In Greek, it means the, the God-bearer, the mother of God. And so that's a problem, obviously, because immediately clergy and lay people were like, well, what are you talking about? Isn't Jesus Christ God? And so Nestorius said he is, but this is what the heresy of Nestorianism is. It's saying that Jesus Christ is two distinct persons. And, you know, we as Catholics, we believe that he is one divine person with a human nature and a divine nature. Nestorius said, no, Jesus Christ is two distinct persons, a divine person and a human person. And that when Mary gave birth to Christ, she gave birth to his human nature and not his divine nature. And so he even pr proposed the name Christotokos, the, you know, the mother of Christ, the Christ bearer rather than the God bearer. And obviously, a lot of people got upset about that because they saw that Christ was God. And so it's kind of this interesting idea where with Arianism, we see this idea that, well, you know, Christ can't be God because a human is so low and could never be, you know, united with Godhood, right? Nestorianism yeah. is kind of this other end of the spectrum, which is interesting, saying that God is so high that he could never come down to such a level. You know, it's below God to be born of a woman. And as a consequence, Nestorius also didn't believe that Christ, that God died on the cross. He believed that it was Christ's human nature that was born, and it was Christ's human nature that was crucified and died. And so... There's a lot of back and forth, and I think we're probably going to get into that, but that's essentially what he believed. So he, the sort of the, the center of it was on Mary, like you yeah. said, this Theotokos. Yes. That's what Christ, started it. Right, so Mary didn't bear Christ. And then, so that sort of, again, we see it sort of ripples out. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have to then deny the unity of Christ's yep. humanity as divinity. Yes. Um, so what would, I'm sorry. I, I can't remember if it's Nestorianism or if it's a different heresy that said that only the humanity of Christ died on the cross, not the divinity of Christ. Yeah, that was, that was Nestorius. So that was Nestorius, yeah, because then, again, with there is, if it goes back to, like I was saying with Arianism, like if God isn't dying, then it's not really a big deal. Yeah. So when, when you separate, like Nestorius trying to separate the God from the man, it almost... He was almost going about it like he, was, like you said, he was trying to really make God high. But when you separate man, the man of Christ from the God of Christ, you're basically saying, well, now there's, now there's four. Yeah. You know, we don't worship the Holy quadra Quadratic. You know, we worship the Holy Trinity. <laughs> yeah. I think something that's helpful to understand, you know, I, I, we can look to the scriptures and see places where we can see why Nestorius is wrong. But I think just on principle, just logically speaking, we don't give birth to natures. We give birth to persons. We give birth to a to a person. We don't just give birth to their nature, right? So to say that, you know, Mary just gave birth to Christ's human nature, that doesn't really make sense. She gave birth she gave birth to a person, a divine person, albeit, but still a person and more than just a single nature. So maybe that's worth reflecting on what's the difference between a person and a nature. Yeah. Mm. So this is, this is actually a simple way that I think gets to it. It's your nature is the answer to the question what, and your person is the answer to the question who, right? So if you came up to me and you said, what am I? Well, I'd say I'm a human being. If you said, who am I? I wouldn't say I'm a human being. I'd say I'm Harrison. It's my identity. And so if you were to go to Christ and say the same thing, you could say, you know, what are you? I'm God. Who are you? I'm Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. 
And so it was, um, who was it? Pope Leo the Great, actually, in response to Nestorius, who said that uh, he wrote, like, this whole book kind of, like, talking to Nestorius and his ideas. He said, um, each nature performs the actions proper to it, but every action is done by the person. And in the case of Christ, it would be by that one divine person, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. So it would be two examples. So let's say Christ did everything. Yeah. So what would be something he did in his humanity? What would be something he did in his divinity? That'd be like, okay, so like the Gospel of Matthew when he like heals like the, the lame and the leper, right? Like it's not proper to human nature to be able to perform miracles and to do the supernatural, right? But it is proper to the divine nature, to God. And so Jesus Christ, through his divine nature, performed miracles, right? But we can also say, so we can say that, you know, Jesus Christ, God himself, performed miracles because of that divine nature. But just, it's not proper to the divine nature to require food or water to, you know, keep your body functioning. But it is necessary to your human nature. So when Christ in his human nature ate food and drank water, we can say that God himself ate food and drank water because the person of Christ did that. So I guess, and this is where it's such a challenging idea, but I guess it's how it holds together. So to say Christ is both fully human and fully divine, you're embracing that the person is able to do both of those. things. is completely can enter into both of those realities. Like we talked about these heresies, let's try to get rid of one. Okay, so that's human aspect. Well, he didn't really die. That's hard to believe. Or the divine, you know, he didn't really have all the power that God had because it, yeah. it doesn't fit together. But sort of the dramatic truth of our faith is that they always have to be both at the same time and always. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Interesting. And I, mean, now, I think it's also important for us to remember that we are never going to fully understand either Christ and the Hypostatic Union or the Trinity because it's beyond our comprehension and it's a mystery. And I'm not saying we shouldn't look into it. I'm just saying when you try and get this far into it, you're going to try with your human limitations to understand what is limitless. And that's where you've gone to problems. And that's, somebody actually put in the comment section the story of Augustine. Um, he was on the beach and he saw this kid who oh, dug yeah. a hole and was bringing the bucket of water to the hole and, you know, he kept pouring the bucket in. And Augustine asked him, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm going to put the ocean or the sea in this hole. And Augustine said, that you'll never happen. And he says, neither will you understand the Trinity. <laughs> and the kid disappears as an angel. Some, some great, like, old world story. Yeah. But, and that's sort of the idea is, you know, God is too big, like you're saying. So um, it's beautiful to get these perspectives. It's almost like seeing something. You can never get all the facets of the diamonds. You know, yeah. you just get different yeah. glimpses and you try to get perspectives on the truth without ever understanding completely. And maybe that's something we've been almost doing. It's almost like a negative theology. We're saying, you know, we're kind of saying these things are true of God, but it's much easier to say these things are not true. These yeah. things, it can't be true of Christ to say, He's less than God. You can't be true to say he's not fully human. Um, it's much easier to just deny the false parts. Yeah, it's like the church kind of sets up guardrails. Like, don't go past this, and you're you're good to go. It's actually a great analogy, Harrison. That's yeah, and, and even then, it's fun. It's interesting when you go through church history, there are points where the church doesn't even quite distinguish. Like, you know, when it comes to free will and God's, you know, providence, where are we free, you know, how can we fit those two together? The church almost, there was this, you know, medieval argument about it. The church said, we're not going to decide on it. You know, they, we just, let's stop fighting about it. We yeah. can't, we'll never get it. Well, yeah. It's good. The Orthodox do to this day. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, it's yeah, Which it's, is the worst thing. It's good to have like a healthy discussion about these things. Cause it's like, yeah. like you were saying, Thomism versus Molinism. Like the church is saying, okay, here's two schools of thought on free will that you can have a healthy discussion about. Just don't go past these guardrails and don't start, don't go past these things which are wrong. And then you can have some theological debate about it in a healthy way. And that's actually, so the next thing I want to talk to you about with this, uh, especially when you're talking about Nestorianism, a blessed mother. Yeah. Now there's certain topics that have that same idea, but what would, what would you say the relationship is to our, of our Blessed Mother to these teachings about Christ? In, in what manner? What do you mean? Like, so it I seems like, like when you're, we're arguing about Christ's humanity and divinity, our Blessed Mother was almost dragged into it. Like, what does she have to do with this? And yet she seems like an essential part of the argument. Yeah, I mean, so Nestorius, his gripe was with Mary herself. He explicitly said, Mary is not the Theotokos, the Mother of God. And... 
the reason why it upset people is not just because this was some kind of like vague idea that people were very passionate about. It's no, Mary is a, a person. She was an integral part of the, the life of Christ. And so people had a devotion to her. People were asking for her intercession and things like that. And so all of a sudden to say she wasn't the mother of God, well, that's kind of just to deny a very special honor that God gave her. You know, it's, I, I don't, I really don't like hearing people say this like, oh, Mary was just a vessel that God used and tossed aside. No, God from all eternity chose to allow his only begotten son to dwell in the womb of Mary for nine months and then be born from her and then allow her to nurture himself, God himself, for 30 years, essentially, uh, essentially until we see him in the Gospels, you know? And that, that's a big deal to say that, you know, God himself chose to be born of a woman and chose to be raised by a woman, and we don't know most of what happened to Christ before the gospel because he was just with Mary as a normal human being that was also God. And so what, what about the other sort of Marian doctrines? Are they, yeah. Would they have a similar sort of controversial aspects to them? Like where do they follow from? Yeah, so with Nestorius, he, he only had like the an issue with the dogma of Mary, the mother of God. But I think that it can... It leads to, if you did reject that Mary was not the mother of God, it can lead you to reject the other Marian dogma. So, like, okay, let's say she didn't give birth to Christ. I mean, she didn't give birth to God. Okay, so then she didn't have to be immaculately conceived then. She didn't have to be this new Eve, this, you know, this taintless, untarnished vessel, the Ark of the New Covenant, who had to bear God, right? Well, then, what's another consequence of that? Okay, the perpetual virginity. If Christ wasn't God, that means that, he didn't have to be the only thing that Mary carried in her womb. You know, in, in the Ark of the Old Covenant, the only thing that was allowed to be within it was the things prescribed by God, the Ten Commandments and other things. And so with Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant, the reason why, part of the reason why I believe she was a perpetual virgin was because the only thing to be prescribed to be in her womb was God himself. And it wouldn't be fitting for Mary or God to have anything else in her womb. But if Christ wasn't God, we don't need that either. And then ultimately, once the Immaculate Conception goes you lose the assumption too because the assumption follows from the Immaculate Conception. If Mary wasn't conceived without sin, she has no need of death. Then she has no need to be assumed into heaven. So you take, you kind of like not flick down the first domino of the divine motherhood of Mary and then all the foundations or at least part of the foundations of all these other dogmas start to fall then. Yeah, I think you know, that's, that's really interesting to think about. And um, one of my favorite stories is... Um, G.K. Chesterton, he talks about, you know, you can't have a child without a mother. You said, yeah. like, this person, you can't have Christ without his mother. So he tells the story of, you know, after the Protestant Reformation, there was this, you know, Swiss town, and they had a statue of Mary holding the child Jesus in the center of the town, and it was a problem, of course. They didn't like this idea of veneration for Mary, this connection. So they were trying to figure out how to get rid of Mary, and they couldn't. So what they ended up doing is chipping away Christ from the statue to sort of separate them. But there's really, you can't just have a child floating. You know, you need the mother to hold the child. The mother is the source of the child. Um, so in many ways, as soon as you get rid of Mary, you can't make sense of Christ, this human being. And again, this sort of, you, you destroy his full humanity when you eliminate the mother. I think it's such a gift to the church that we have a mother, you know, that yeah. she's been given to us as this beautiful source of consolation, strength, and, and a model for all of us as you spoke out in those other... Uh, of the teachings yeah i think it's uh you know god could have come down any way that he wanted to but he deliberately chose from all eternity to be born of a woman like that that yeah. wasn't out of you know pure metaphysical necessity he he chose to do that for a reason and this is i think it was fulton sheen who said this it's you know christ spent 10 times as much time with mary than he did with any other person on earth he spent roughly three years with the apostles and 30 years with Mary, and even the time he did spend with his apostles was also with Mary. So if even God himself, Jesus Christ, saw it proper to have a, a deep and profound relationship with Mary, well, then I think it's proper for us too. Certainly. Awesome. Yeah, my, so any, my, my question when it comes to people who say that Mary is the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God, at what point did Jesus become God? Yeah, that's like did, 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 did like as he as he was born the womb did like the Holy Spirit come down and enter the baby? Was so, it like when he hit puberty? Like when when does Jesus if he's not born God, when does he become God? Yeah, and you you bring up a series of other 
heresies then. Adoptionism. We're talking about, right, adoptionism to say that, you know, yes. at some point God chose him to be his son. Um, or, or docetism, where he just seemed to be God, but he wasn't really. Yeah. Or he just seemed to be human, but he wasn't really. Yeah. Yeah. And, I don't know, I just want to share, like, one, like, two things from Scripture that we know that Mary really is the mother of God. We know that, like, in the Old Testament, a lot of times, we see throughout the Psalms and throughout the prophecies that God is called Lord, right? Even, even in the Gospel of uh, St. John, when St. Thomas sees Christ after the resurrection, he says, you know, my Lord and my God. He addresses Jesus as Lord and God. And I think it's interesting yeah. that when we see in um, the first chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke, what does Elizabeth say? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Even Elizabeth at that moment recognized that Mary was the mother of God in that little instant. So that's, that's yeah. kind of like my favorite go-to verse to see. You know, like, no, Christ, even in the womb, that was God. Yeah, that, and that's throughout Scripture, you know, from the very beginning, you see these signs that he was adored, he was worshipped, he was yeah. recognized, you know, the predictions of who he would be, it's yeah. all there. Great. Any uh, other thoughts about Nestorianism? Don't be one. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, do we have any questions that are coming in? Oh, yeah, uh, comments. Not that, uh, not that I saw. I mean, there was like, uh, there was like one or two, but you answered them as you were talking. I didn't okay. want to interrupt because I kind of knew you were. Wow, gonna get we're just that good. I, I mean, so I knew the one I saw, some of the ones that the were one in I the comments, that, I knew you were going to get there, so I just kind of let you go. <laughs> the one I thought was interesting was um, when did Christ know he? When did Jesus know he was God? I I'd, I'd say at the point where a person <laughs> naturally reaches the age of reason, because my understanding is God. I'll, God allowed himself to be subjected to the limits of development. And at the point that he reached the age of reason, he was omniscient. Is that correct? It, it, and this is, I always find this why it's so interesting. Because, I mean, when he was discovered at the temple, as, we don't know, how old is he? Do, do we know when he was? 13. Yeah. He was 13, so he clearly knew by then yeah. that he was God. But, and, and so a lot of, the, and this is one of those interesting areas of theology where it's, there is some speculation. So in his humanity, there's different schools of thought, but you know, in his humanity, he knew only as much as he could know as a human being to some degree. Like he wouldn't have known French in his humanity because nobody spoke French then. It wouldn't have yeah. been, he didn't know how to build a rocket. <laughs> but in his divinity, he knew all things. Yeah. And so that relationship is interesting to reflect on. You know, So in his humanity, at what point did he know, what point did he develop that knowledge in the same sense that he knew he was God in that intimate link between his two natures. Yeah. Um, I mean, so people point to, yeah, go ahead. sorry. Yeah. People point to the moments like in the temple, they point to the, um, the baptism of the Jordan when he willingly chose to descend into the waters to take on our sinful humanity. Um, he completely knew his mission, like you said, in the agony in the garden, because he even says he doesn't know the hour. You know, there's, there's these moments of not knowing, which are clearly stated in the scripture. You know, he says, only the father knows the hour of the end. You know, as he starts to come to the end of his ministry, the end of time, he speaks of not knowing it. So it, it's interesting to speculate on how that works in the relationship between his humanity and his divinity. I don't, I don't think that, that last one you mentioned means he didn't know. Like, I think he did have knowledge. I, well, I remember, remember uh, Rafi, the Muslim who came up to me at Hofstra. We had like, yeah, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. I wasn't there, but oh yeah. So like when I was at Hofstra one day, we had like a table that said like I'm Catholic. Catholic, ask me anything about Catholicism. And one of the Muslims came up to me and asked me about that specific one. You know, how can you say that Jesus Christ is God? He explicitly says, I do not know. Right. And for those who may not be unaware, like Muslims don't believe Jesus Christ is God. They, they, you know, the development of Islam was influenced by Arianism and Nestorianism slightly. And so they, they believe that Jesus Christ was just a very good prophet, but not God. And so we, we had a, a heated discussion about that. But I, I don't think it means that he didn't know. I think it means something else. Well, why not in his humanity he, could, he didn't know? That, but that kind of seems problematic to me, that in his humanity. What does that even mean, though? In his humanity, Jesus Christ was a single person, so he either knew or he didn't. Well, that's as a two-year-old in his humanity. Did he know? Did he know how to speak? 
you know, as a one-year-old. No, he had to learn from Mary and Joseph. So we speak of him having to learn. Yeah. So that's where, in becoming fully human, he subjected himself to limitation. So in his yeah. humanity, he was limited. So that's almost the beauty of his condescension, is that he lowered himself to the point of having to learn from a man and a woman. But he didn't. And so there's these, okay. so there's these beautiful sort of, you know, there's this beautiful consecration, St. Joseph, who talks about Joseph taught Jesus how to be a man in some sense. You know, Mary taught him compassion in a way. And not, not that he wasn't perfect already, but he knew perfectly what he was able to know with the time and place and age, and um, so it's, which is it's sort of a beautiful, challenging idea. Yeah, so it's kind of like he... He, it's not that he didn't know in the strict sense. He did know, but he chose not to access that knowledge. Is that a way that you could put it? And, and that's where I think there's, it's very, there's maybe a bit of a mystery in there, yeah. you know. That's so good. Christ, interesting. as you talked about the person, you know, Jesus Christ, the person, knew all things for all time. Yeah. But in his humanity, you know, it, it had its own soul. Christ had his own soul and body, his own will. So there was that relationship is... I mean, I, I don't know. If, I, I can't say I know the answer completely. Yeah. <laughs> you could, it's, um, it's one of those really interesting areas of theology to reflect on. Because Christ only had one mind, correct? He had two wills, two natures, but he was one person, one mind, right? Uh, I'm going to be careful on that one. Okay, I yeah. think we're about to delve into heresy ourselves. Here. Yeah, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to press the heresy. Oh, boy, yeah, this, here we go, here we go. It's getting good. <laughs> yeah, no, this Maybe is... This is this is interesting. This is how it happens, though, because, you know, what are we trying to do? We're trying to delve in and really pinpoint yeah. something. We're trying, that, to under, we're trying to comprehend that which is uncomprehensible. Yeah, and, and so we can say what's not true. Like, yeah. we can say, you know, God doesn't lack any knowledge. So Christ, as a member of the Trinity, doesn't lack any knowledge. But yet he was fully human, which means he was limited. How that express? how that translates into reality it's 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 hard to really put pen to paper on it yeah because who was it it was peter who said lord you know when he asked me like peter do you love me he said lord you know all things right. so, hmm. interesting hmm. Nah. Is, uh, nice. something to pray about and reflect on <laughs> you ever wonder like jesus would have like if like he was like born let's say like 20 years ago, and now we have, like, 20-year-old Jesus, like, what he'd be into in his human side, you know? He'd be into like, going maybe, to Mass daily. Well, he'd be going to the <laughs> That's right. Well, no, we wouldn't have Mass yet, into. right? If, if he'd come now instead of 2,000 years ago, we wouldn't have Mass yet, right? Like, Yeah, that's true. You know? Like, well, you got the idea. No, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> well, like, and like, that, you know, what, like, 2020 what, what, Jesus that's what, what the, that's what the saints are. Yeah. They're Christ <laughs> present in our own time. Yeah. Because, like... Like the Carlos, uh, Carlos Cudis, yeah. that young boy, yeah, like the, uh, it's cool to see. I think he's blessed. Yeah, he's just. Well, I think he's becoming blessed. Okay, it. or is yeah. he that yet? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not familiar so with this person. This young guy, he is good with the technology. He built a website. To, oh, he's you know, he's becoming blessed. Yeah, nice. to preach about the the real presence, the Eucharistic miracles, you know, which is kind of a a cool expression of a saintly life you know he was into technology he made a website about the blessed sacrament like you know this young kid that was sort of a an expression of holiness in a very different time than christ and it, it almost adds to the beauty of it by seeing you know the presence of of christ in different times that's me reading the saints across history yeah. because they give you more glimpses of who christ is in different ways I think that's fair. I'd say Padre Pio was the most Christ-like figure since St. Francis, probably. There was something very... I, I, I'd agree with that. Because I'm trying to... It, it's hard. Go for it. It's hard to compare saints. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just saying, like, as far as, like, when I read the scriptures and I see what type of person Christ was and I compare it to the lives of saints, Padre Pio comes to mind immediately. And I'm trying to think of anyone in between him and St. Francis of Assisi that like imitated Christ to such a degree that they received the stigmata. That's literally thousands of years or 8,000 years. Right? Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> aged like 700 that. years. Yeah, it's probably someone in there. St. Saint Paul. That's all I can think of. Like those three are the three people I think were the closest imitators to Christ. 
it's it's hard because you know it, it, you can imagine eyes. somebody yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah it's like Saint too. Therese de Blasseau. <laughs> She wouldn't have the potential to imitate him in that same way. Yeah. So it's a very different model, but she lived out her vocation perfectly and beautifully. And as a, a, a sister living in a convent, praying and, you know, enduring the rattle of the other sister's seeds <laughs> and, you know, growing in patience and holiness through those sorts of things, yeah. um, through her sickness and suffering. Um, but it is, yeah, it's interesting, you know, Maximilian Colby, you know, something pretty, He's hardcore. So sacrificial. Like, Absolutely. You know, if you talk about a crucifixion, innocent death for the sake of others, yeah. Um, yeah, it's beautiful to think about. Great. Um, I guess that's why we also I think that's a good series. conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <That's> <laughs> we should have another heresy. series on that. Yeah, isn't that another her- what is there a name for that heresy when you Which deny one? saints or something, or is that not a heresy? I mean, there like, are. I know it's you know there are Protestants who don't like the idea of saints, but I don't know if there's an official heretic. Some of them. Yeah. Protestant. Yeah, some of them do, but there's some who don't. True. There's some who don't. True. Some don't. Yeah, but. Yeah, that's for next time. All right. Well, what's higher season you doing next tune in, time? For tune in next week to know about. We're gonna do iconoclasm and donatism next time. You want to give like a quick like two sentence description of what they are so people can uh maybe think about it as we uh sure um iconoclasm essentially says that the use of images is a serious sin like of statues of paintings you know even mosaics that's a serious sin and donatism if i'm not mistaken is the idea that the uh if a priest is very is sinful then his sacraments are not valid is that correct the, the holiness yeah. of the priest is directly, t- well, not, I shouldn't say that. The sinfulness of the priest is directly tied to the validness of his sacraments. Meaning if a, if, a, if a priest is like a sinner, like if he's like a drunk or like a murderer, that means he, he, he can't hear confessions, he can't baptize, he can't say mass, he can't do anything. Yeah, it's interesting, especially in our times. So I think it'll be a, yeah. a good conversation. I think, yeah. I think both of those are very good for our times. Yes, yeah, so make sure you tune in next week for that, 7.30, Tuesday. Um, yeah, that'll be, yeah, both very relevant. That'll be fun. So, all right. yeah. All right. Yeah. Father, I want to close us out right. in the Ave Maria. Sure. Amen. Ave Maria. Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria. Grazia plena. Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu mulieribus. Benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. May God bless you all, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.